damp homes in the UK um, have been an issue for, for decades. Um, people have looked at them. They've been given names like sick buildings, which are now out of fashion. Um, and it's a very complex um, question. Now, is a damp home bad for our health? I think we can pretty much say yes, easily. But why is it bad for our health is a really hard question to answer. But I'm going to attempt to simplify it um, here uh, by um, offering some simple guidelines and showing you some resources that you can go to if you are worried about having a damp home. So to start off with just a little bit of history, I think uh, many of you may already know about this, but I didn't know all of it anyway. Um, this is not a new problem. Damp homes have been a problem for at least the last two and a half thousand years. If you, you can find us this passage in Leviticus 14, which I believe is in the Old Testament of the Bible. So it was written about two and a half thousand years ago. And it was specifically about the dangers of living in a moldy home, amazingly what to do, and also contains instructions on what to do about it to prevent health problems. It starts off as follows. Um, if your home is mouldy, it must be torn down. It's stones, timbers, and all the plaster and taken out of the town to an unclean place. So no, no uh, fudging the issue there. It carries on. Anyone who goes into the house while it is closed up will be unclean till evening. Not quite sure why evening makes a difference, but anyone who sleeps or eats in the house must wash his clothes. Okay, with our modern understanding. Remember two and a half thousand years ago, they had no idea of what a fungus was or what spores were or anything to do with, with microbes were. So this is actually reasonably useful. Um, but if the priest comes to examine it, the home, and the mildew has not spread after the house has been plastered, he shall pronounce them the house clean because of the mildew is gone. This sounds very up to date for something that's so old. Uh, to our modern ears, this sounds like really good advice. Um, and in some circumstances, very similar sorts of uh, approach are still practiced. But then unfortunately the next a uh, few verses, things go a bit uh, uh, downhill. I'll read you the first bit. To purify the house, he is to take two birds, some cedar wood, scarlet yarn and hyssop. He shall kill one of the birds over fresh water in a clay pot. Then he is to take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet yarn and the live bird, dip them in the blood of the dead bird and sprinkle the house several times. Now, I can't say that that's a good approach uh, now to uh, if you have a damp home. So I'll try and provide slightly more up-to-date information than that. So millennia later, is there still a risk to our health from damp homes? If so, what causes that risk to health? Here's a picture of a nice, uh, well, that's a tile there. So this looks like a worktop. So this must be a, possibly a kitchen or a bathroom. And just above that, there is plaster and lots and lots of damp coming through, pushing up the paint in various places. And we've actually got what looks like an algae growing on it. it and that doesn't grow unless it's very wet indeed. So quite definitely, we certainly still have problems with damp dwellings. A lot of the problems, well, some of the problems that we, um, some of the causes of problems that we have now uh, we can date back to the 1970s energy crisis. Oops, I keep clicking the wrong button. In the 1970s, for those old, of you, old enough to remember, the price of oil shot up because the people who produce oil decided to cut supply. And as it rose, there was um, certainly going to be a need to not burn as much oil. So, uh, Various, the government at the time, so we've got Ted Heath. Uh, I don't remember it going into Margaret Thatcher's time. I think it was Ted Heath's time. Um, you can see many of the features of the 1970s. Um, miners went on strike. Uh, 
I think we had the three day week, the bread makers went on strike, all because there were a problem with the price of energy. It was now vitally important to stop using as much expensive energy as it was before. Now, that almost certainly sounds very familiar to all of us right now. We're in the middle of a brand new energy crisis and the cost of energy has shot up. So who knows? We have to be very careful about not making the same mistakes as we did back then. Back then, there were lots of incentives to cut our energy usage, particularly heat, by installing double glazing. And here is, I remember very well, secondary double glazing. So you've got your, your windows, your ordinary, your, your standard windows at the front and they, there was a whole market in selling you panes of glass that you could put behind your windows to make, to conserve energy. And it was a cheap form of double glazing, I guess. Lofts were insulated, drafts were eliminated. A lot of the time, very, uh, with very good results um, to preserve energy and to preserve heat. However, at the same time, as you're locking out drafts, you're locking out ventilation. Um, and not enough emphasis was placed back then, and probably still isn't to this day, about ventilation. The houses were now warmer, but the internal air is no longer being refreshed with outside air. That's effectively what drafts are doing. There are they're blowing outside air into the inside environment and elsewhere in the home, inside air is being blown out of the home through these gaps and the drafts. And that worked reasonably well until we started stopping those drafts. Why is that a problem? And the main problem is excess moisture. Seems a bit odd. Where is all this moisture coming from? First of all, starting at the bottom, um, the obvious things, or sometimes not very obvious, moisture can enter our houses through cracks in the roof, cracks in the walls, uh, cracks in the foundations. Um, older houses, which I think I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, um, allow water inflow into the into the structure, which quite naturally is part of their their design. Um, in some places, and I know my uh, mother-in-law lives in a, one such place where water at, at wet times of the year can actually flow under the, under the house, which is quite amazing. So you've really got to know a lot about the house, the house you're living in, uh, in order to tell where excess moisture can be coming from. But all of this may be fine. Your house may be a uh, new house, it, it's been built well. There, there is no leaks, there are no breakages and whatever, but your house can still be damp. And the reason for that is is something that is, is vastly misunderstood. We're starting to um, get better understanding around this, but essentially us living in those houses generates huge amounts of moisture. Uh, just breathing out, one person will breathe out 0.2 of a litre of water per hour. We sweat 0.03 of a litre per hour. If we have a shower or a bath, about 1.5 litres of water can enter the atmosphere of the home. Similarly, cooking, the actual gas you're burning can produce water. Everything you're boiling on, that, on a hob produces water. Uh, it can be up to three litres going in to the atmosphere of your home. Um, Every time that happens, dishwashers, one litre, clothes drying, probably the, the biggest culprit. If you are, and right now at this time of year, most people are trying to dry their clothes indoors in some way with a, a dryer or hanging them up somewhere inside in, in, in the warmer environment inside because they simply aren't drying in the cold weather outside. And that brings in litres and litres of water uh, to the home and clothes washing per load, half a litre. So there's a huge influx of moisture. And if you've blocked up all those ways that your indoor air can get outdoors, uh, all that water will stay in your home as water vapour. Now you might have a shower and there's water on the walls, there's water on the windows, but if you leave it a few hours, that disappears and it will 
that water on the walls and windows will evaporate, but it stayed in your home unless you've opened the window. So why is that a problem? It's in the air. It's not causing any, any health issues. Well, uh, when you go to bed at night, our heating, most of us, will go off. We prefer cooler houses during the night as we sleep. Um, during the, the air can cool significantly. Uh, also, there are cold areas in lots of homes, um, especially during this cold weather, which will, um, on walls and windows, uh, external windows especially, uh, these are cold enough for condensation to start. But that's the, that's the water you can see. As the air cools, all that water vapor in the air can be released uh, and it literally falls it must fall as a sort of um, very light rain, I suppose you could picture it. It's exactly the same principle as, what, as why a meadow on a cold morning can be covered in dew. Uh, I think I've got a picture. Yep. <clears throat> Here's grass in the meadow, first thing in the morning. It's been a cold night, dripping with water. Now, this water hasn't come out of the plant. This water has come out of the air and it's condensed onto the cold surface. As the air temperature drops, the, the air is unable to hang onto that water vapor and releases it onto the nearest surface, in this case, grass and uh, a toadstool. Uh, in your home, when that happens, you can imagine all that water ends up on your absorbent carpet, your soft furnishings. Um, the windows themselves can stream with water. Um, you've suddenly got an issue that your you, you, lots of surfaces of your home have now got enough moisture on them to feed microbes, and microbes will start to grow. If this happens every night, uh, and of of course, it doesn't happen all year round because uh, in the summer, the nights don't get this cold, but autumn, winter, early spring, this kind of thing may well happen. Your home is now a lot damper than you think. You won't notice it. Um, <coughs> uh, it's insidious. Um, and it's a gradually increasing problem that you're not aware of until you start to notice molds growing on the walls behind. Uh, furniture and in confined spaces particularly where airflow is limited the the water can settle and the if the wall is cold the the area behind a piece of furniture can get much colder than the rest of the room and you can have this effect in limited parts of your room tends to be where the the autumn is is condensation time essentially because we've had our um windows open all summer in the nice warm weather and they we rapidly close them as autumn and winter start and carry on living them as we did before. Uh, we close them to keep in heat, but we've also reduced ventilation dramatically. And um, what will happen in most people's houses and certainly happens in my house, um, you've suddenly realized your windows are absolutely covered in condensation. Well, so are your walls, so are your floors, so are your soft furnishings. You can, it's just that you can see it on those surfaces. Humidity can get so bad uh, and I have no people that, that claim that they they do this. Uh, landlords that claim people do this. They just keep increasing the room temperature as you feel, well, I've got dampness. So the cure of that is to have a higher temperature. And it works to some extent because as you increase the temperature, you can suspend more water in the air. Um, but that water is still in your home. You haven't got rid of it unless you ventilate it. So... There is another physical issue, which I've experienced myself, where as you get warmer and the humidity rises and more water ends up in the air, it actually feels colder and you keep the temperature goes up and up and up because you keep compensating for more and more water in the air. Uh, it's cheaper to ventilate than it is to go through this cycle of heating more and more uh, because you don't feel warm in a very humid atmosphere. Essentially, in a nutshell, if there is water streaming down your windows, then you need to open them. Let all that wet air out. It's as simple as that. Uh, solutions. Um, well, clearly, if you've got leaks like this, there's a, I think this is a radiator leaking onto a wooden floor. Or here, we've got a more 
difficult to spot. Staining on a ceiling, which there's clearly water dripping down somewhere above. And in these circumstances, you're going to need an expert, unless you're competent to, to fix this, uh, to go upstairs and trace the, the uh, source of this water, uh, you're going to need an expert and I'll tell you uh, how to get one of them shortly. Whoops. In an older home, I alluded to before, this is a Victorian home. They tend not to be built with, uh, or some of them tend not to be built with cavity wall. So there's no gap between an outer wall and an inner wall as there is on a modern home. Uh, there can be no um, damp course around the home. So any, if, if you live in a high water table sort of area, then uh, during the winter, as it rains a lot, the water table rises and you can get water quite naturally soaking up into your house. Uh, these homes were built well before the advent of central heating and they, they, are, they are intended to be used with an open fire possibly in more than one room. Uh, windows are sash windows, old and rattly. Um, they, they, they will let drafts in and so on. So there's plenty of air going in and out. Um, this wall here is, is green. It looks like it's uh, probably just been cleared of having a plant growing up here, which isn't going to help the whole uh, problem of damp getting into that wall if plants are there, keeping that surface of the wall moist. Rain falling onto this if it's a solid wall well, is, is intended to percolate through the solid wall, um, at least in part, and into your home and in, evaporating when on the inner, inner surface of those walls. So you've got to ventilate that out for these older houses to actually work properly. <clears throat> um, trouble is, after the 1970s, double glazing, uh, closing up of uh, chimneys would have been closed up with things to stop the draft going coming from chimneys and so on. And the result is that all this water is getting into the property. You, we are not getting rid of it well enough. People don't want <coughs> uh, fans uh, on all the time. They can be quite noisy, especially in bathrooms upstairs. But it's important that those things stay open. It's important that these windows are opened to allow all this moisture to go out. And I would keep them open um, until the moisture has disappeared from the window the condensation has disappeared. To get an expert, uh, RICS have this website, the uh, Royal Institute for Chartered Surveyors, which is a good way, offers a lot of good information on how to deal with damp and how to find an expert. And also this organization, ISSE, Institute for Specialized <coughs> Surveyors and Engineers, um, will also help you get a good um, expert. <clears throat> now that's important because if you were to open your what used to be the yellow pages and just look up a damp expert there are a lot of people out there that lack experience there are no extensive training programs for them to visit and you can get end up with someone who really doesn't know what they're doing so it's best to get someone with lots of experience going through one of these um, in, in, institutions solution to damp isolate if you're carrying out wet activities like cooking, showering, close that door and keep it closed while you ventilate that room. Um, that's one way of avoiding moisture getting into the rest of your house. Again, if you've done that, you've left the door open, the room will dry out, but all that moisture has gone into the rest of your house. So it's still hanging around there and may well end up at the back of your cupboard or your wardrobe in your bedroom. Then ventilate, uh, simple as opening the windows. So a lot of these rooms that are designed to um, deal with moisture have extractor fans. Um, there are some um, there are some that have extractor fans that stay on all the time, which is probably the best way of doing it at low low speed. And then they sense when the humidity rises and they increase the speed to get rid of the moisture. Those are probably the best, or some of the best. Um, but of course, your um, you you have to cope with the fact that these fans are the the ones that are on all the time tend to be quieter actually the better quality you have to spend more money on them um, and uh, they will control moisture 
reasonably well, but of course they're, they're removing some warmth out of the room at the same time. So there are versions which are a little bit more expensive, extractor fans, um, mechanical ventilation, that will capture some of that heat. They, they, they could sort of estimate 18, 90% of that heat and recirculate it into the home so you don't lose that home. That's that's the most probably the most expensive solution, but also probably the best solution. You can use these dehumidifiers, um, but make sure you get a, a one that's suitable for the size of room you're dehumidifying. We see quite small machines being used with that will capture maybe half a pint of water, something like one of these, um, which I think are designed really for cupboards rather than the um, rooms. They might remove about half a liter in a day or a few days, whereas we've just shown you that the room that it's in may be uh, exposed to many liters of water. So really you need something like this, which is 10, 15 liter capacity to, to remove that. They do work, but they're expensive and they're expensive to run. They have an advantage is they may preserve more of, the, more of the heat in your home at the same time. So what do we know about health problems? Um, this is a bit of an area of controversy. People have argued about this for decades. So I'm going to keep it simple. Um, with regard to um, microbes, a damp home can allow microbes to grow. That's fungus, bacteria. Uh, from, if that is growing on your home, of course, there's a risk of infection. So one of the microbes that will grow in a damp home is Aspergillus fumigatus. It's not particularly common. It doesn't grow everywhere, but um, it can be found. And that is a risk of infection if you're vulnerable, which is... And we, we sounds like we might know a bit more about vulnerability in the next few years as Paul's work progresses. Um, these microbes produce a, a really quite nasty allergens. And the allergens themselves can be things like proteases, which can literally damage lung tissue. Um, we could refer to them as toxins. Uh, bacteria and fungi both produce these toxins of different types. Um, bacteria tend to produce quite a lot, molds not so much. Um, so a lot of talk, uh, a lot of work has been done looking to see if fungi in our damp home can make enough mycotoxin to have a significant effect on the health of the occupants. And the answer still is we don't think so. We don't think they make enough um, toxin to, to cause problems. Um, there might be, there is uh, one paper which shows that in inhaling a particular um, mycotoxin, I think it is, tends to um, slow down the ability of your lung to clean itself using the tiny cilia hairs that line our lungs. And it slows them down enough in some cases to allow an infection to begin. So that's one example of one proven example that I'm aware of, of a toxin. I think it was a mycotoxin that has increased susceptibility to infection. And these things, when they're damp, also, and, and they're attacked by microbial um, growth, um, release irritant harmful gases. So your breathing will start to get more irritated. Um, you'll be able to smell it sometimes. That damp odor that we often notice and causes issues uh, can be um, a problem. We're going to have to speed up a bit. Uh, NHS now offers particular advice on this, uh, of this uh, link. Uh, if you look up damp homes on the NHS website, you will get this link. Um, you, if you have damp mold in your home, you're more likely to have respiratory problems because your lungs are the main source of impact of damp and everything that is in damp homes. Respiratory infections, allergies or asthma and worsening asthma as well. Oh, damp and mold can also affect the immune system. And I've just described one example uh, of that happening. Uh, I don't know of many others that have been demonstrated yet. Who is susceptible? Again, NHS advice, babies and children, older people, uh, like older people, I would say, probably the over 60s. Those with existing skin problems, such as eczema. There's research that shows eczema is associated with damp homes. Those with respiratory problems, such as this group, who have uh, severe asthma, allergies, it can make your asthma worse. 
and those with a weakened immune system, um, such as we just was discussed earlier. Uh, they're less able to fight off the increased threat of infection. Um, I would also mention there's an increased incidence of sinusitis. And of course, aspergillosis is something that um, <laughs> some people blame. I've got the impression that um, when they were exposed to a damp home was when they first became aware that they had ABPA, for example. Okay. The watchword, I would say, with no doubt whatsoever, nobody should live in a damp home. Be aware of your home. Be, learn to manage the moisture levels in your home. Learn to see the danger signs um, that moisture is accumulating. For non-vulnerable people, there are still lots and lots of people who don't seem to be made ill by damp homes, which is we don't really understand why some people are and some people are not. This remains unclear. Um, for help, if you have a, if you're renting a damp home, uh, the same NHS website cites UK resources for you to get help cleaning up and remediating your home. There are local home grants. Citizens Advice website has a whole page, has pages on this. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in America, there's a very nice, quite a complete um, set of pages at the epa.gov which um, gives lots of advice on how to clean and uh, remediate your own home if you can. The NHS has now published extremely good, uh, NICE have now published extremely good advice for the NHS um, on indoor air quality, including damp, uh, but lots of other factors as well that in, uh, affect indoor health. This is aimed at this whole list of professions and also members of the public. So this is really useful. If you've got a damp home and you're going to your doctor and saying, I don't feel well, my, I think my home is damp, your doctor can refer to this document or you can refer your doctor to this document. Uh, and it's now an extensive, comprehensive guide um, for um, how to deal with health issues in damp homes available from the NHS and NICE. Uh, I think I do the link here. Yes, there it is. NG149, extremely comprehensive. Also in 2018, a new law was passed in the UK clarifying that all rented homes must be fit for human habitation. Um, this link, and we are going to put these um, slides up on um, aspergillosis.org website under the WAD pages, so you can access all this information at a later date. After the tragic death of Awabi Shack in 2020, um, the awareness of the risk to health that damp causes has never been clearer. A coroner has specifically identified a mouldy home as a cause for death. This has never happened before. This may well lead to damp and mould being given higher risk ratings in the authorities that are required to make sure our homes are indeed fit for our habitation. Awareness of the need to ensure excess moisture is removed from our home has never been more important, regardless of the need to conserve energy. And I think we're finally getting the message on that. 